Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's community meeting for Bus Network Redesign. We're going to allow people a few more minutes to join before we begin, but thank you for your patience. Again, welcome to tonight's uh, public meeting on Bus Network Redesign's equity analyses. We'll begin in just one more minute. It looks like we're leveling off on attendees. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to get started. I want to again uh, welcome everybody to tonight's community meeting on bus network redesign uh, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Lindsay Heffernan and I'll be serving as the moderator for tonight's meeting. If we can go to the next slide, please. And one more. Thank you. I'd like to first note that all MBTA activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. The MBTA complies with all federal and state civil rights requirements, preventing discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, limited English proficiency, and additional protected characteristics. We welcome the diversity from across our entire service area. And if you have any questions or concerns, please visit our website, on the screen in front of you at mbta.com backslash title six, spelt with a VI, to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Next slide, please. Uh, I, again, I'd like to remind everyone the rules for participating in this meeting, um, as well as remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded. We do plan for the meeting uh, to end by 7.30. While we wish we were able to do this meeting in person, we're hoping that we have designed an online public meeting that will be interactive and provide an opportunity for us to have a conversation together. Before we, we can begin that conversation, I want to review a few technical aspects of the Zoom platform. We can go to the next slide, please. First of all, we have many folks helping us with interpretation this evening. Uh, we have ASL interpreters, both Tracy and, um, excuse me, both Denise and Carrie. Um, if you would like to view the ASL interpreters at all times, you can select uh, the side-by-side -side speaker option, and that will keep both the speaker and the ASL interpreter visible at all times. We also have interpreters tonight who are translating the meeting uh, into both uh, Spanish and Mandarin. If you require these services, please click the interpretation button on your screen. That looks like a globe at the bot bottom icon and select which language you wish to hear. And I'm now gonna ask uh, Tracy, our Spanish language interpreter to say a few words.
I'm not hearing Tracy, so I just want to confirm that she's in the main room. If I can just ask for some technical support, it sounds like she's in the English channel. Um, and so Tracy, you should be able to speak. Hold on one second for us as we deal with this technical glitch. People are saying they can hear her and I can't hear her. So I guess I will continue. <laughs> uh, and I am now going to ask our Mandarin interpreter uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Tracy, and sorry for that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so very much, Ani. And now I do just want to clarify for all English speakers, don't get caught in the trap I was just caught in. Please select English as your chosen language on the interpretation button so that you're able to hear comments in the different uh, rooms if need be. Uh, again, don't be me. Click English if, you, if that's the language that you need. Given the number of interpreters that we have working with us this evening to make this meeting fully accessible, I would just like to remind individuals who may choose to speak during our public comment to speak slowly and give time for the interpreters uh, to be able to translate. And next slide, please. Uh, all attendees will be muted during the presentation to prevent uh, excessive background noise. If you're viewing this meeting on a computer, you can toggle to the speaker view to see the presentation more prominently. If you're on a smartphone, you can swipe uh, to view changes, uh, to, 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 excuse me, to change your view. Uh, you may also use the Q&A button uh, to submit a typed question or comment at any point during the meeting. We will be monitoring the Q&A chat during the presentation, but we do ask you to hold your substantive comments and questions for the question and answer session that we will be having later in this meeting. In addition, if you are having a technical problem, please share your issue in the Q&A feature at any point during the meeting, and we will respond as quickly as possible. I will note these questions will not be visible to all attendees once submitted, but we will try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion of the meeting. I will also note that if you use inappropriate language, you will be removed from the meeting. And next slide, please. I think I covered the Q&A comment. If we can go to the next, perfect, thank you. So again, why are we here tonight? My name is Lindsay Heffernan. I'm the Assistant General Manager for Policy and Transit Planning at the MBTA, and I am the moderator for this evening. Equity is one of the MBTA's core values. And in this meeting, we will be providing an overview of the equity implications for bus network redesign, both to fulfill our internal values, but also to meet our federal obligations under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Three of my colleagues are joining me this evening and our agenda is as follows. First, um, with a bus network redesign, uh, or we fondly referred to as BNERD. Uh, equity overview will be Justin Antos, the Senior Director of Bus Transformation. 
Then I'll invite Melissa Dulay, our Senior Director of Service Planning, to share our efforts to do ongoing monitoring of equity in all of our service metrics. And lastly, you'll hear from Stephen Povich, our Director of Fair Policy and Analytics, to talk about the results of the Title VI equity analysis itself. And at this point, I am going to turn the meeting over to Justin for the next few slides. Justin, you can go forward a slide, please. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Justin Antos, and I work on the bus transformation team here at the MBTA. Our team will be leading the implementation of the bus network redesign. Tonight, I want to distinguish between equity and Title VI. They are similar terms, and we are officially here to talk about the Title VI findings of the bus network redesign, which is a legal requirement, as Lindsay said. But I wanna start tonight talking more broadly about the spirit of equity and how this project has pursued that spirit of equity from the start. Next slide, please. In the last over two years of planning and redesigning our bus network, we have been listening to you our riders about what makes good bus service. And it's not rocket science. We heard four main themes. Buses need to one, go where you want them to go when you want them. Two, go there frequently and reliably. Three, be easy to understand. And four, to serve the people who need bus service the most. And I want to talk about that component in the bottom right. To live up to this goal, our team challenged ourselves to lead with equity first as we were drawing the map, not simply checking afterwards to make sure it was fairly drawn. Next slide. To do this, and to put buses where people actually want to go, we use travel data um, based on cell phones, completely anonymous, of course, which for the first time gave us data on how people actually travel um, for all trips, on all modes, including those who are not on the bus today, but who could be in the future. We also did extra work to confirm that this location-based services data or LBS data is representative for the populations we are interested in tonight, minority and low-income populations. And we also supplemented this data with surveys for senior citizens who we found were less likely to own a smartphone. Next slide, please. To lead with equity first, as I said, we were able to associate travel with a user's home region and their demographics so that we could, as someone travels through the region, we could keep the demographics associated with that travel. And this was especially important in redesigning the bus network so we could understand how specifically low income and people of color travel in all parts of the network, not just for the trip to and from their house. So this redesign is based on the best information we've ever had on how low income residents and people of color travel. And this allowed us to prioritize trips made by those groups twice as much. To repeat, we weighted more heavily in this bus network redesign, travel from the groups we are interested in the equity analysis tonight. This also assured that new service we propose in this service proposal reflects everyone, whether they had time to participate in our outreach or not, whether they even know what the best project is, better bus project is or not, or whether or not they are even using the T today or not. This reflects our commitment to transit critical populations. 
Next slide, please. As a result, the redesigned bus network brings high frequency service. That is a bus or a vehicle every 15 minutes or better, seven days a week, all hours of the day to 95,000 more minority residents across the Boston region, increasing our coverage from 42% to 55% of minority residents. Next slide, please. Same with low income. This new network brings high frequency transit to almost 30,000 new low income households. This proposal is a 25% increase in bus service to those who need it the most. And it increases our, our coverage from 36% to 49%. Next slide, please. In summary, we started out this project leading with equity and to fill gaps in our in transit service in our bus network for people who need buses the most. We used good data on our equity populations. We weighted our decisions toward those populations and the results you see brings more and better bus service to those groups. Next, I wanna hand this to Melissa DeLay to talk about how we're going to make sure that this promise um, is met as we implement this project. Melissa. Thanks, Justin. My name is Melissa Dulay, and I'm the Senior Director of Service Planning. We heard from Justin about how he considered equity in the bus network redesign process, but that's not the end. We continue to evaluate equity in how we deliver service. Every year, as defined by our service delivery policy, which is pictured on this slide, we look at performance using measures of service availability and service quality. We look at span, that's when service is operating, uh, how frequently it operates, coverage or where the service operates, accessibility, reliability, comfort or how crowded service is, and network quality, i.e. how the network overall serves the region. Now, each standard has an equity check where we check the performance of the network against our standard and then the performance for low-income riders and our riders of color to check for differences. By understanding how we perform on this annual report, we can prioritize how we make schedule changes throughout the year to address any deficiencies that might be identified, both to make service compliant overall and also to ensure that we are doing so in an equitable way. Next, we have Stephen Povich, Director of Fair Policy and Analytics, to talk about the Title VI equity amount. Thank you, Melissa. And good evening, everyone. We can go to the next slide, please. As Melissa and Justin mentioned, I'm here to talk about the Title VI equity analysis. Next slide, please. The Title VI equity analysis thinks about equity in a slightly different way from how we've been discussing it previously tonight. But in accordance with the Civil Rights Act and guidance from the FDA, we evaluate major service and fare changes for disparate impacts on minority riders or disproportionate burdens on low-income riders. We're really asking two questions with these analyses. On the service side, we ask, how does the change in the amount of service provided to protected populations compare to the change for all other riders? And on the fare side, how does the change in the average fare paid by protected populations compare to the change for all riders? This is a relatively technical exercise. We work with the central transportation planning staff on this analysis, and you can read their memo on the bus network redesign webpage, which is also linked on this slide that will be posted to the same page. Next slide, please. Now, on the service equity side, as I mentioned, we consider how the change in the amount of service provided to protected populations compares to the change in the amount of service provided to all other riders. We calculate 12 ratios to understand this analysis. It's three ratios on two metrics to two different protected populations. The relative change ratio 
compares the percent change in service for protected riders to the percent change in service to other riders. The share of change compares the share of the total change for protected populations to the share of change, excuse me, to the share of existing for those populations. And the absolute change compares the nominal or absolute amount of change in service for protected populations versus all other riders. For each of these ratios, we consider the ratio in terms of revenue vehicle hours and route length, and again, for both low income and minority riders. We can go to the next slide and look at the results. Of the 12 ratios, we find that on 11 of the 12, there is not a potential disparate impact or disproportionate burden on minority or low income riders. These are the results we would expect to see with all the planning that Justin and Melissa have already discussed this evening. There is one area where we find that the metric, excuse me, that the ratio does not meet our minimum metric, and that is on the absolute change ratio for revenue vehicle hours on low income riders. We find this to be a relatively weak metric and a poor indicator of equity, and I'll explain in a little bit more detail on the next slide. As I mentioned, the absolute change ratio compares the nominal or absolute change in service for our protected riders and all other riders. The challenge here is that it doesn't take into account the amount of service that is already provided or the amount of people that are in the category that is being protected or not protected. I think a simpler example can walk through why this is a bit of a challenge. If you take a case where 20% of service before a change 20 of 100 revenue vehicle hours are provided to the low income population and add 10 revenue vehicle hours for low income riders versus 20 for non low income riders. We can calculate a number of ratios and a number of percent changes to demonstrate why this is somewhat out of whack. Before the change, low income riders represent 20% of service and after they represent 23 and equity enhancement. They see a 50% increase in service while no income, low income riders see only a 25% increase in service. And a third of the service increase, 10 of the 30 incremental revenue hours are for low income riders in this simple example, whereas only 20% of the previous service uh, serve those populations. Unfortunately, because the absolute change ratio does not consider the revenue vehicle hours before the change or after the change, this does not pass the absolute change ratio, despite passing all of our other uh, ratios and all the analysis that went into a project like bus network redesign. It's important to note that in the spring of 2023, the MBTA will be updating our DIDB policy. We intend to revise elements of the policy that have not functioned properly to ensure equity, such as this absolute change ratio. Now, in terms of fair equity, again, we ask the question, how does the change in average fare paid by low income or minority riders compare to the change in the average fare paid by all riders? I would note that importantly, bus network redesign does not change the fare levels in an explicit way, but we conduct this analysis because we know that the addition or removal or change of some bus routes may cause riders to take a subway when they previously took a bus or vice versa, or perhaps another one of our modes, commuter rail or ferry. And we know that these different modes have different prices, and so there could be an implicit fare change in these service changes. We look at the relative change for fare equity, comparing the percent change in fares for protected populations to the percent change in fares for all riders. Next slide, please. In terms of the fair equity results, we find that we pass both on the minority and low income ratios, the disparate impact and disproportionate burden. There is not a potential finding from this analysis. We can go to the next slide, please. With that, I'll pass the mic back to Lindsay Heffernan, who can moderate questions and comments. 
Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, before we open up for comments and questions segment to the public, we would like to invite any elected officials who are in attendance or their staff to, uh, to ask questions or make comments. Please use the raised hand feature so we can recognize and unmute you. And it looks as though we have a comment from a uh, city councilor in Revere, uh, Ira Novlevsky. I'm gonna welcome you to unmute and then I'll be moving on to everybody else who's here this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to be here. I'm glad I could uh, stay on for a little while. I do have another meeting to go to in the middle of this, but uh, I had to stick around for this one. Um, as I noted in my question and answers, uh, I have a uh, serious concern about the 411 route on Oak Island Street in Revere. Uh, which is adjacent to the Jack Satter House, which has over 300 senior citizens. And uh, one of the proposals that we noticed on the uh, fair changes was to eliminate that and move a bus stop down to North Shore Road. Uh, what's happening is a lot of these senior citizens are in walkers. Uh, it's over almost a half a mile from the Satter House down to this proposed bus stop. And many are in walkers, some are in wheelchairs. And the bus stop that's there now is very imperative to stay. Uh, we had a meeting down there, and actually we had a little, uh, a little protest uh, last week, uh, which was covered by Channel 4. And the folks down there are very, very upset that there's going to be a change to uh, potentially eliminating this bus stop. And we do not want that to happen. North Shore Road is a is 1A uh, coming out of Lynn, uh, coming from via to Lynn and Marble Air from Scott. And uh, it's a very dangerous highway where the proposed bus stop is going. In the last three or four years, we've had three fatalities at this location. And I don't know, I don't know if Council Powers is on, who's the Ward 5 Council representing that neighborhood, uh, but he is emphatic that this should not happen. Uh, also with the 411 route, uh, I was upset that they eliminated bus, I think three bus stops on Ocean Avenue between Revere Street and Beach Street, and then eliminated one bus stop at uh, Beach Street and Marshall Road. Uh, right now, no other bus stops have been made to replace them and uh, leading the Paperwork, again, is making people walk anywhere from 800 feet up to 1,500 feet, which in a lot of cases are senior citizens. Uh, and it's been very difficult. I've seen people sitting at the closed bus stop, which was closed maybe about three months ago. And they took down the shelter and uh, the city had given the MBTA some property out of a little park. Uh, with that bus stop and nothing has been done to replace the way it was when, you, when we, the city gave it to you folks. So we have uh, already sent a letter in through the mayor's office uh, and a vote of the Revere City Council to put that park back into its original conditions. So hopefully that'll be done. I know it's winter time and it can happen now, but I would expect that, hopefully expect that to be uh, done in the spring. So with that, uh, again, you know, we're not happy with some of these uh, changes and I hope that you would reconsider uh, le leaving the bus stop at the uh, Oak Island location and um, see what happens with uh, the rest of the people. Uh, on Ocean Ave, uh, it's a major construction area in the development and we have over 3,000 people down in that neighborhood now. So uh, we would ask that you think about putting at least one bus stop back uh, somewhere near there. And I know it's near the Review Beach uh, Wonderland Station, but it's still a long walk for uh, people to go to. So. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councilor Novlevsky. Uh, I, I do appreciate your comments um, and we'll certainly be passing those down regarding the 411 and the other routes you mentioned for our service planning and bus transformation team. Uh, Tonight, we are here to discuss the equity analysis for bus network redesign, but I'll make sure those comments get passed on to the members of the MBTA team. Uh, I am going to uh, go to our next comment, I believe from 
uh, Daniel uh, Rizzo, who I believe might be our mayor of Revere, uh, you should be able to unmute. Um, I think I just unmuted. Can you hear you, me? Okay? I can hear you just fine. Yes, thank oh, you. <laughs> okay, it's uh, it's good to be here, and um, I am the former mayor, um, oh. so uh, <laughs> I did want to uh, I did want to weigh in. And uh, apologies, what you just said. We're here just to go over the equity piece, and it sounds like not specific bus routes. And I I, I apologize because I really wanted to join this call to um, to to talk about what Councilman Novoselsky just uh, said, which was the 411 bus line uh, that services the Jack Satter House. That's very, very important. Uh, the Jack Satter House is, you know, uh, um, senior citizen living. Uh, many, many of them rely on public transportation and uh, in particular that bus stop that um, sits adjacent to their building. And so of course, you know, when you see a plan to remove that and have them uh, have to go down. I don't know that it's a half a mile, as Councilor Novoselsky had alluded to, but it's certainly a long distance. And then to cross a major, major road, uh, North Shore Road, um, it, it, you know, it's a, a really beyond being an inconvenience. It's a dangerous situation. So I don't want to tie up this meeting because I, I, again, apologies for not sticking on topic. But while I I did listen and enjoy all the comments from all the speakers uh, who spoke and, and uh, learned a bit um, uh, about the process and so on. Um, I didn't just want to sign off and say nothing when I really thought that maybe I could get my point across with the 411. So um, with that, I thank you for the job thank that you, you do. Uh, public transportation in Revere, as you know, is critical uh, to our city. So um, thank you all for the job you do. And thank you and apologize for my misconstruing your current position, uh, former, former Mayor Rizzo from Revere. Uh, as, as was noted, we appreciate that Bus Network Redesign is presenting major changes for riders uh, uh, across uh, the wide spectrum of our bus network. We certainly endeavor to have, to have more than the vast majority of those be positive, uh, but appreciate that there are impacts to certain communities. And again, I will make sure those specific routes get noted for our planning team as they move forward on implementation. Uh, I believe um, I have one more raised hand, I believe from an elected official, and then we'll be getting getting to our the public who are here. I believe Mr. Is it Mr. Benson? Um, you should be able to unmute. Thank you. I'm I can a, hear you. Thank you. I'm Go ahead. Town meeting member in Arlington representing precinct 10, which runs from route to um, part of the way to Massachusetts Avenue and along route 60 on both sides and then west of route 60. My questions relating to the equity analysis. One is, was any equity analysis done on the impact on elderly populations. It was not mentioned. And I understand and agree with the need to look at uh, low income and um, minority populations, but I feel like the failure, it looks like to consider elderly populations raises major issues for equity and the Older Americans Act. And I'm a senior myself and my bus is disappearing and I'm very concerned about that. Related to that, which I didn't understand from the equity analysis, is areas of our town where there are minority populations that will continue to have one high frequency route but are losing other bus routes that went in other directions. And I felt like that was not taken into consideration in the equity analysis. I wonder if that was, as well as an area that had four bus routes and now we'll have only two. So I'm just wondering, did the equity analysis consider older people? Did the equity analysis consider reduction in bus service that was not a high frequency route? and reduction in the number of routes. And also when the routes ran, one route used to run till 9.30 mm -hmm. in the evening. Now it ends at 6.30 in the evening. How were those all taken into consideration? Sure, thank you. Uh, a couple compound questions there. So let's try to un unpack that here. Um, 
so I want to first take the, um, uh, the, if I can, the second question first and invite um, my colleague um, Stephen Povich to, to, to join us here again on the how we look at multiple routes and um, uh, I think it's in, in revenue vehicle hours is where, we, where, where we're probably going to land. But uh, Stephen, I'll wel welcome you to add into a response to uh, Mr. Benson. Sure, thank you, and, and it's a great question. Um, and, and that's right. In terms of the amount of service that's being provided for the service equity analysis, we look at two metrics, revenue vehicle hours, which would be captured by the amount of time of day that the route is running, how frequently it's running, et cetera, and the route length, which is the miles of the routes uh, that are serving those populations. Um, and so uh, to the extent new routes were added or routes were lengthened, that is also captured. I would note that if routes are combined, that technically is a decrease in route length. Although if two routes are parallel and combined, uh, there's no real impact on, on service. But, but really specifically to your question, I think your concern is captured by revenue vehicle hours. Um, so that is, that is part of the analysis. And I'd pass it back to Lindsay on sure. the first part of the question. Sure. Um, first of all, as it comes to um, uh, Title VI or required equity analysis that we're here to present this evening, uh, we are required as an organization specifically to look at uh, minority riders and uh, low-income riders. I uh, appreciate very much your concern and the, and the callers before you concerned about our uh, elderly riders. I do know that there was some inputs that we had in our early data around design, and I'd invite Melissa, uh, if you'd like to unmute and share just a little bit about what that looked like. Thanks, Lindsay. So uh, in terms of the question about how we considered seniors uh, and older adults in the design of the network, that was actually one of the things that was tricky because with our uh, LBS data, that's the location-based services cell phone data, we'd actually had some survey that showed that seniors were underrepresented in the smartphone data. So that was one of the blind spots with the LBS data. So in order to address that head on, uh, we had supplemented with extra outreach. Uh, we'd done survey, uh, we'd coordinated with the Mass Senior uh, Action Coalition and other different affinity groups to make sure that we were able to have targeted outreach to supplement the LBS data uh, with uh, other things to, uh, so that we could understand uh, seniors' travel uh, movements. And then also, it, it wasn't actually just seniors that we were uh, really trying to prioritize uh, with some of our other kind of non-protected characters, but we were looking at other transit-critical uh, riders. So also looking at things like uh, lower no car ownership households and other uh, characteristics that uh, we really wanted to prioritize as well. Thank you, Melissa, very much. Uh, and at this point, um, we really appreciate the input. We're going to invite members of the public now to give us your thoughts. Um, and so my offer here, and it's been on the slide for you for a little while, is that uh, if you would like to um, share a written comment or question, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a typed question or comment. I see we already have a few, so we'll get to those in just a moment. I will alternate between reading questions and comments already submitted and recognizing those uh, who would uh, like to be recognized and pose their question verbally. Uh, please be brief so we can hear from as many people as possible tonight. We've, uh, we're close to 100 attendees at, at one point earlier. Uh, uh, people who wish to share a question or comment verbally can press the raised hand button um, on, their, on their computer. For those who are joining by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star and then the number nine. For attendees who uh, either speak Spanish or Mandarin, please raise your hand to provide your questions or comments verbally to the interpreters to hear, uh, and then we will, we will repeat the comments. I will periodically pause just to see if we have questions in the interpretation rooms. When we recognize your name, you will um, be unmuted and you may then speak. After you share your comment, we will lower your hand and you'll be returned back to mute. Again, please speak slowly so our many interpreters can capture all of your comments. Uh, and I see we have a few raised hands and a few comments, so let's get going. If I can begin um, 
uh, with um, a last name McDonald. You should be able to unmute now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Owen McDonald, uh, Planning Department, Town of Weymouth. Uh, first, uh, please clarify one point. What is the maximum distance from a point of origin, uh, residence or whatever, to say that service is provided, bus service is provided? Uh, a point of origin from there in order to be, could you just say a little more, Mr. McDonald, what you're looking for? So uh, obviously buses could be pretty far away in order to be considered um, an to option for that resident? Just yeah, to say you're providing service for to a, a residence or whatever, is that like quarter mile, half mile? What is that uh, distance on there, the maximum? Sure. And I would um, welcome my colleague, Mr. Antos, to come on back for you. Quick answer, it's a half a mile. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, yeah, you, you'd indicated uh, before that there was uh, the uh, uh, service from Streetlight or uh, Inrix, whoever it was you use, that uh, indicates uh, how uh, people, how various categories of people will travel by all modes. What it may not indicate is what would happen if you were to all of a sudden provide bus service to a location that has not had it. And all of a sudden uh, jobs in say downtown or certain areas uh, all of a sudden become uh, available to people who live there that is not now, that, that's not available to them now because of lack of car ownership or service. Uh, I don't believe the, uh, the uh, uh, the services would indicate that. Just wondered if that was considered at all, and if so, how? In terms of whether the location-based data would help us understand sort of future new destinations that individuals would go to, I, I, I think I can answer for the team and say uh, that's a that is an ever-going work in progress to understand future destinations and um, sort of economic regions and other points of attraction that individuals may want to go to in the future. And probably is incumbent, I can just state clearly on the MBTA, to be paying attention to those and to think about how is our region change in many different ways uh, to, uh, to account for all of that. Um, I will uh, pause for just a second. Um, and I think, I think um, uh, Mr. McDonald, I hope that, I hope that those are responsive to the questions you have. Uh, and now I'm going to move forward to last name uh, Thomas, please. Hello, my name is Omriki Thomas. Um, I first I want to just thank you all for all the work you're doing. I really appreciate the changes overall, and I know it's been a lot of work. So thank you. Um, the main thing I wanted to highlight is just that um, the people who have more time, which are typically typically like the more affluent people. Um, have more time to respond to the surveys and might actually use the buses less. So um, yeah, I know you mentioned something about that earlier, but I, I just wanted to highlight that again. And it's like very, it seems, especially with the new map uh, that came out er earlier this fall, um, it seems like some routes coming back like the 74 were came from, um, more affluent populations who had more time to respond to the surveys and might not be as equitable as would be optimal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your comment. Uh, Justin, I wonder if you want to just respond to how we took public feedback to incorporate um, some changes to the network. And then I will, after this, move to some comments that are in the Q&A. Sure. Um, we took um, a massive amount of public comment this summer. Um, we, at the end, had over 20,000 individual public comments, um, and we um, sorted them all by geography and um, by, by theme of comment. Um, and yes, we saw that some areas were more, um, had more comments than others. Um, however, when we were looking at the network as a whole, um, 
we looked at the themes of all the comments and interpreted those into our service planning process and what you see in the, in the revised network today. Thank you, Justin. And thank you again for your comment. I'm now going to just pivot over. Uh, thank you to those with some raised hands. Just hold tight for me for a minute. We have some written comments. Um, I have read that this redesign is responding to changes of where people live and where they need to go. How in the future will the MBTA keep analyzing changes in the demographics of the area and change bus routes and schedules to serve uh, to serve those changes? And I wonder, um, possibly maybe M Melissa, would you be willing to um, talk about the ongoing work to monitor our network? Yes, let me jump in there. Uh, so the service planning department uh, administers our uh, service delivery policy, which defines how we make ongoing changes to our network for those smaller scale changes that might just be, you know, uh, frequency adjustments because ridership has changed. Uh, we do those on a quarterly basis, uh, but for any major changes, the service delivery policy outlines a process by which we're able to, uh, you know, have a public process, have more conversations similar to bus network redesign, perhaps not necessarily uh, as much of a, a, a blank slate approach, uh, but so that we can make those incremental changes to the network moving forward. So you can read about that at mbta.com slash policies and find the service delivery policy, uh, which talks about that. Uh, I also, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can continue to use some of the methodologies that we uh, used in bus network redesign, that we can tap into the uh, location-based services data set and be able to use that uh, for more uh, analyses moving forward to continue to uh, you know, identify emerging gaps in our system, because that's all based on where people are currently traveling. Uh, it doesn't show you, uh, you know, those new developments that are coming online in two years or five years. Uh, so hopefully we can repeat this process uh, again in the future as we're doing our ongoing uh, service planning. I think we can all say hopefully not 40 years from now, more frequently than that. <laughs> uh, I have a, another comment, Melissa, that might be coming at you. So um, stay with me if you can. We have uh, another comment in the in the chat. Uh, thank you for providing this forum for feedback. I'm wondering how these plans affect the highly inefficient use of resources that are currently in place. As it, for an example, the 501 and 504 buses frequently are delayed to the point that you will wait over an hour in a bus stop. And when they finally arrive, they're too full to get onto a bus. It happened to me about 30 minutes ago. In contrast, buses such as the 9 and 39 pass through the bus stop every five to 10 minutes, completely empty. When calculating equity, is the fact that certain buses do not have frequent enough service while other buses are wasting a huge amount of resources come into play? There's a lot to unpack there. And a, a lot about the, the experience that you're describing kind of depends on where you're standing. Uh, certainly the nine and the 39 also have uh, similar uh, issues with reliability that we face across the system. Uh, as it happens, they turn around right in Copley Square. So it may be that the buses are empty. Uh, if you're you're waiting for one of the express buses, uh, say on St. James Ave uh, coming in, but you know those buses uh, tend to be more full as they're leaving their stops. Their peak load points tend to be at other points. But kind of uh, one of the things that we do look at with the ongoing service monitoring is at how the crowding uh, exists for uh, different routes and how that uh, compares to kind of at a system-wide level for kind of our equity populations versus uh, our non-equity population. So that's how we do our uh, different uh, activities. But we also, we, we recognize that service quality in general in many places uh, has not been good. We're shorthanded by many hundreds of operators right now. So I think that's presented as the the gaps in irregular service that uh, you're definitely experiencing and that you're not alone in experiencing. Many, many others are experiencing that too. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and our next person has put some comments in the chat, but has also a raised hand. So why don't I ask, um, uh, attendee with the last name Forrest, you should be able to unmute. Yes, can you hear me? I can, thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, 
You're doing away, you're getting rid of the 441 route, which has several medical facilities along Paradise Road and also goes to shopping. Whereas the 442 route, which is staying, just drives along the ocean. I'm sure the bus drivers love to drive along the ocean. It's a pretty view. And they have less people to pick up on that route, like along the ocean. So <laughs> I'm not clear. It's not clear to me why, because for, for me, the 441 route is very critical. Why you would select the 442 over the 441. And I use that route for going to and from work. I use it for going to several of the different doctor's offices and also going to shopping in Minden Square. But I, I also see when I take that to, you know, if I go, you know, shopping, there's a lot of workers that work in Paradise Road who get on that bus and, you know, stop and shop or whatever. And, you know, they're getting off on Lewis Street. What are you going to make them go all the way and take the, the Salem bus, like, you know, across the, you know, they have to cross a, a, a good busy highway street and then and then and then walk i mean i if i want to get on the 442 route i have to walk almost probably half to three quarters of a mile some of the way uphill and this is this would be you know carrying my laptop and everything and to me it's a hardship don't i mean don't get me wrong i i understand why you're you're reviewing this but just understand when you do away with routes you are creating hardships and you're, you're giving other, you know, the buses to other routes, which to me, they don't need twice as many buses. We, we need more bus routes. That's, that's my input. Sure, sure. I want, I want to thank you very much, um, Ms. Forrest, for joining us this evening and, and sharing your concerns and certainly appreciate them. Uh, we recognize that any change we make has the possibility to bring benefits to some and burdens to others. I do want to remind people this evening that the individuals on this call are best suited to try to address the questions of the equity analysis that we uh, conducted and the use of equity in the system. But, and I appreciate how, how you weave some of that in for us and your, in, in your concerns. And I will certainly make sure that um, individuals from both the service plane and bus transformation team are aware of the concerns that you've raised regarding those specific routes of the 441 and the 442. If I can ask um, the next person on my list, last name Bonds, you should be able to unmute. Oh, here it is. Thank there you. We, I can hear you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before you and your panel. Uh, Mine is only a comment. Um, when repeating the process, uh, the community, particularly those who are often underserved and underrepresented, would like to be seated at the table during the initial drafting of the decisions that are being made that eventually impact uh, various members of the communities, uh, as you say, favorably and unfavorably. To come upon uh, uh, and to attend meetings after decisions have already been made uh, leaves us at a point where we're now in a position of um, not having a, a major impact on how those decisions are formed at the initial stage of operation. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in future endeavors uh, with the um, MBTA, and we're hoping that you will uh, call upon us uh, at the beginning. Secondly, uh, there is some concern that the increase in the number of suburbanites who are trying to cut back on the economic costs of driving into our city, that the buses are more favorably supporting those individuals than those of us who continue to live in the city, who have not abandoned the city and who have remained in the city. And now we feel that there are shortages being made and sacrifices being made and placed upon those of us who've remained in the city to accommodate those who have chosen to leave uh, our surroundings. So I wanna thank you very much. And again, hopefully next time uh, we can be uh, at the beginning of the initial draft and not uh, at the end. Thank you very much and best to you all and best thank you. to you all in the holiday. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonds, for the for the comment and um appreciate the concern that you're raising. I think the MBTA, you, while they, we used a lot of data to drive the initial map, certainly our intention this summer in receiving over 20,000 comments was to allow 
the public to tell us where did the data, you know, where, where was the data not the right thing to follow and what else do we need to hear? Um, but I will be passing along uh, your concern around uh, the balance between the urban and the maybe more suburban communities uh, to my colleagues. Um, and next, uh, can we um, unmute, uh, uh, should be last name Bush. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Mella Bush. Hi, Mella. Hi, all. <laughs> we meet again. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for allowing us to speak this evening. I have a few issues uh, that I would like to uh, denote here. Um, first of all, we got to this place and, and commenting on what the last person said about being at the front and not the, the end of these processes would have made them come out a lot better. It should have been done with a people's plan. Uh, and 20,000 uh, comments is great, but how many people ride the bus every day? So that's just a drop in the bucket. And many people, even to this day, still don't know what we're talking about when we say bus network redesign uh, that we um, speak to. So I'm gonna speed this up, my question is how can you move forward with an equity analysis when equity was not actually considered um, when the data was collected? So using um, cell phone data seems to have brought us to the point where we see um, more affluent riders being prioritized over like um, senior citizens our older adults, and also low-income and people of color who may not have had their data collected because they might have been writing it. Well, they may not have those level of smartphones. They may have some old um, things. So how can you actually come to this point when you started out on a bad foot? Um, also, there was there are some late night and early morning service buses that are being eliminated, and they were there was a challenge brought to the FTA uh, from uh, there was a complaint sent to the FTA about eliminating early morning and late night service, and some of the things that are happening here and are not being analyzed are eliminating a bus like the 171 bus. And that's a specific example of a bus that uh, travels uh, seven days a week, one trip per day to get people to early morning shift jobs uh, throughout the city and at the airport. And it's also 191. But in this, in this plan, that bus is eliminated because it was too confusing to the people who were planning, I, I guess. So how can you... Um, have an equity analysis when we see that there is gentrification happening because of this um, and as well as people not being considered and eliminating um, service to people that need to get to places and they will no longer be able to get to their jobs, they won't be able to get to shopping and taking like the most the most, the busy, one of the busiest button, buses in the system and changing it so that people have to now get on a subway and fares are supposed to be being considered in this meeting as well. So like the 28 bus, people will now have to get on the, uh, at Roxbury Crossing to go to Ruggles where the bus used to terminate there and they're going to have to pay step up transfers. And a number of these, um, a number of these, uh, uh, changes and root changes are causing people to have to do that in low income in communities of color, EJ communities, and those folks are not, uh, and they, you know, having to pay a couple of dollars per day more than they do now will put a, a, a burden on them that would be disparate to other folks in other areas who cost is not an issue. So those are my observations and questions. How can you justify doing Thank those? You. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much. Glad glad you could be with us tonight. Um, 
I have a, a couple of those fill our, our comments for us, and a couple of those are some questions. So let's try to see what which of the questions we can we can uh, manage some responses to. I want to first start off um, uh, that with the piece around um, cell phone data, sort of versus survey data, and getting people's demographic information, and invite one of our colleagues um, who I didn't introduce before, Jenilise Prescott, our um, Senior Director of the Office of Performance Management and Innovation, uh, part of our data analytics crew. Um, Jenilise. Good evening, everyone. Um, I can address some of the pieces around cell phone data and um, the demographics of the people who uh, were represented by the cell phone data. So one of the reasons that the team initially conducted a survey of seniors was the review of the demographics of the region um, did not necessarily indicate that the cell phone data was going to adequately cover that population. So that's why we did additional outreach around seniors, as Melissa and Justin had mentioned previously. The other um, demographic categories that we've talked about tonight, including people of color, low-income folks, um, people who do not have access to cars or who house, whose households have low access to vehicles um, were adequately accounted for in those cell phone um, data demographics. Uh, they, they mapped on quite nicely to what we observe in the region. Um, so that, that was why we did not do additional outreach beyond the location-based services data um, for other populations beyond seniors. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll also want to just comment, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Stephen Povich in a minute for the step up transfer question regarding fares. But before getting to that, um, you noted there was a, a route that had um, uh, some late night service and that 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 got cut. Uh, I think you mentioned the 171 and the 191. And I will just note that um, in this meeting, we're here to look at uh, uh, how how we address equity and bus network redesign at the network level. Uh, we all we are confident that the new map does enhance equity in our service area overall. Some areas will have more service, some will have less, and some will have service that is different from today. We will continue to ensure that as we roll out these new routes, that we do so in as equitable a manner as possible and try to react to the changing service needs uh, that will continue to be presented in the greater Boston area. I would love to um, invite uh, Stephen to maybe if you want to comment on step up transfers, uh, that is when somebody pays a bus fare and then they're transferring to a subway, uh, they have to pay the potentially the differential um, between those between those two fares. Stephen? Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, as you mentioned, when riders transfer between our services of different prices, in some cases, they'll pay a step up transfer, or in other cases, it will be free, depending on the difference in price between the first and second service. For example, a transfer from a bus to a bus is at no charge, and from a subway to a bus is also free because the subway is a higher price. Mela, I appreciate in your comment that in certain cases, it may become the case that riders will be charged a step up transfer because the new route, uh, the new routes will make a better journey uh, via bus and subway as opposed to multiple buses or just one bus. In the fair equity analysis that we conducted, we looked across the whole network, as Lindsay mentioned, and found that on average, the change in fares, first of all, was a reduction, and second of all, was at least as much of a reduction for our protected populations as it was for all riders on average. And so though there may be an example here or there where some riders of some populations end up with a slightly higher fare on some of their trips. There are many examples across our network, and on average, it is the consensus across the network um, that, that, that there isn't an inequitable finding um, for the implicit change in fares. But I appreciate the question um, and thank you. Thank you very much. We do have an awful lot of comments in the chat, so I'm going to go to those. I appreciate those with some raised hands. Just bear with me. Um, I'm going to start with um, a question. Uh, or maybe a, a, a comment, let's see. <laughs> I'm wondering if proximity to train lines is a factor in changing bus maps. I used to live in Alston where I had access to both the green line as well as the 66 and the 57. So I had options if one was running behind. Now further out in Brighton, if the 57 is delayed frequently, 
I'm sort of stranded as a person without a car. Uh, and I'm wondering if, Melissa, you might be able to comment on how the, uh, the rail network is figured into our overall service uh, mesh coverage. Certainly. Thanks for the question. Um, one of the things we were trying to do was have the bus network complement the rapid transit network. Uh, we're, we're fortunate to have the uh, frequency and coverage that the rapid transit and the rest of the MBTA network provide. Uh, but one of the things we were thinking very much about was how we could make more either feeder services or how we could also complement the rapid transit, which tends to be very radial with lines going into Boston, and how we could complement that with making more uh, circumferential, more crosstown connections. And very intentionally, in some cases, we were trying to make routes that might connect red to the green to the orange or orange to the blue or getting more of those crosstown connections so that overall the bus network and the rail network could complement each other and be a, a true cohesive network. Sort of big picture. Hopefully that uh, addresses your question. Thank you very much, Melissa. I'm going to a next question. Um, uh, and that is in the uh, in the comment and chat. What is the time frame uh, from the cell phone data? Is the pandemic accounted for in terms of how people are traveling and where people live? I think, as many of you know, uh, and I believe I'm, I know this commenter. This has been a process many years in the making of uh, certain longer than I have been at the T. Uh, and that cell phone data is, uh, I believe, my colleagues tell me pulled from October of 2019. Uh, the next question I have in the chat is, it seems like the MBTA did a good job in equity overall. Did the a uh, agency conduct equity research broken down into areas or regions? Um, and so for a Title VI um, equity analysis, the answer to that would be no. Um, we are looking, uh, we're required to look at the network overall and determine uh, frankly, the distribution of our all of our resources to all of our riders and whether that is equitable versus a um, look neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, but thank you very much for your question. Uh, the next question is, why is this comment period for this equity analysis 13 days? Could you please clarify the MBTA's understanding of the agency's notice and comment period requirements for such a project. Uh, note that's coming from a lawyer for the Alternatives for Community Environment uh, in Roxbury. Uh, our current policies don't list a timeline by which we need to put those on um, those the equity analysis out. Uh, we were endeavoring to have give people approximately two weeks notice before uh, the board meeting with the opportunity for this hearing to be heard and obviously the ability to um, reach out to our board of directors who will be reviewing this material at their meeting uh, next week as, as well. Um, I note the uh, next next comment. Um, I apologizing for turning in a little late, but I understand the 80 and 87 buses from Lechmere have been restored in the new plan, um, but the 80 has not. Is it possible to restore the 80 as we have many seniors in our area? Um, that is another comment I'm happy to pass along to our my colleagues in service planning and in uh, bus transformation as they move forward to implementation to let them know the concern about that particular route. Uh, does the equity analysis include consideration of other services, whether MBTA or not, such as rail, subway, uh, or municipal micro transit? Uh, there's an interesting uh, combination of things there. Services outside of the MBTA, uh, such as um, microtransit or other uh, RTA services, no. Uh, when we think about something such as the fare equity analysis, we are looking at fares for average fares for all of our riders and so our rider group, but that would be um, limited to the MBTA's riders. Um, uh, okay, um, I'm wondering how the analysis relates to the planned version of the uh, DIDB policy, that's um, disparate impact disproportionate burden policy in the spring 2023 that was referenced. If the policy is going to be revised or revision is underway, it seems possibly concerning that such a massive project was analyzing according to an old policy when clearly there's need for a revision. And I'm wondering if and how that was addressed. Thank you and thank you to everyone involved in this work. Uh, the um, 
I'm happy to take that one. The Title VI, uh, uh, D Title VI requires that the MBTA have a policy in order to, to delineate how we conduct service and fair equity analyses. That policy was written in 2017, uh, has been on the plate for some time, wanting to, uh, for staff thinking that there were gaps and things that we have learned since 2017 when it was written. One of those being, for instance, the absolute change metric, which we don't think is actually a fair uh, determination and frankly hinders our ability to make services more equitable um, versus sort of keep locking in the status quo. Uh, I will say that uh, as an organization, we were awaiting further guidance from the Federal Transit Administration who upon the Biden administration's arrival had suggested that they would be releasing new guidance uh, that has not come out. And I think as an organization, we have decided we have waited as long as we can. So we're beginning the process to revise that policy. Uh, and I anticipate in the um, early spring, we'll be sharing something for public comment and there will be a public hearing where you can share your thoughts with us about how we can uh, continue to improve that policy. Um, uh, next question is um, a person apologized for joining late and asked if there is a plan to increase the 501 or other express bus frequency. They often only come once every 45 minutes and for some residents it's the only way to get home. I want to thank you for giving uh, this response to us and we'll share it with our service and planning team, or excuse me, our service planning team. Uh, but here we're here tonight to talk about our equity analysis for bus network redesign. Um, okay, uh, the, we have another comment regarding the 411. Um, uh, uh, where people are and where they go is your question. Um, I believe that's referencing to an earlier slide. The elderly go grocery shopping and the condo residents of Revere uh, Beach Boulevard who have given up their cars take the 411 Oak Island Street Revere to go shopping to Malden. Please reconsider ending this stop because it's unrealistic. Um, impossible to think that elders with mobility issues can get to an alternative stop on North Shore Road. Um, I want to thank you very much for your comment. We're, we're certainly hearing uh, the 411 as a concern for community members. Uh, there's a comment here, um, and that is um, uh, Charlestown Bus 92 and 93 MBTA want to stop 92. Not quite sure how to respond to that, uh, but I will uh, share with our service planning team some concerns about uh, how the 92 and 93 are being treated. Um, I have some more comments in the chat, but why don't I move back to uh, another raised hand. Uh, last name of Bregman, you should be able to unmute. Um, we're not hearing you. It looks like you're still muted. Oh, maybe we have lost last name Bregman. All right, it looks like your hand went down. So maybe that was inadvertent. Certainly if you wanted to speak, please feel free to put your hand back up. Uh, last name of Hanson, I'm gonna un unmute you now. Hi, my name Hi. is I am from Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm listening to all this. Uh, I, I'm very happy that, you know, the lead with equity is finally something that's actually you're trying to do. And I understand that. And I think it's very important um, being from Somerville, uh, living in four square miles with 80, 000, more than 80,000 people at this point, uh, all different kinds of people uh, who really move around the city on the buses. Uh, very much, and it's very, very important to the elderly. But I think overall, what I want to say is, I feel like a lot of this talk is creating a false choice between people, uh, people who need to drive, uh, uh, use the bus lines um, because they don't have cars and stuff like that, which is absolutely the most important thing. And those, all those routes should be be expanded. But there's also um, the choice of like in Somerville, we have a lot of people who don't have cars because they don't, we're trying to get the cars off the street. So this is choice between equity and environmental um, stuff, you know, like keeping keeping the cars off the street. So I don't understand like why we can't, I understand this all has to do with money and it has to do with in the general sense, 
But the expansion, we need more bus lines instead of, um, I understand what your job is to do is to sort of try and stop redundancies and make and, and create a path towards more efficiencies and equity. But at the same time, it feels like a false choice to me. I think that we need more bus lines, more train lines. The MBTA is not as good as it could be. It, and you're trying to make it better, but making this choice between these things is, is hard for me to understand. I have to say also your presentation, um, it's not actually the easiest thing to understand. So I just <laughs> want you to know that. So do you understand where I'm coming from on what I'm saying? I, I, I yeah. No, I think you raised some sort of existential questions for the MBTA uh, and is our goal to serve uh, low income and minority riders is our goal to uh, lessen the impacts of climate change in and I think your challenge is to say it's both uh, and in a resource constrained world. Uh, that is that does become tricky and I, I, I hope you can appreciate that as well, uh, we have. We hear you that this is not straightforward and we apologize for holding a public meeting with a lot of math and a lot of ratios. <laughs> uh, that's how these analyses are conducted uh, and we tried to make it simpler, but we will endeavor to be better next time around. Um, uh, I would I would note that you know part of the overarching plan here for bus network redesign, just to your first point on um, service is is to ultimately increase uh, bus service by 25%. So we are trying to acknowledge that bus is very important to the MBTA, a very important subset of our riders, and we'd like to continue to serve them and to do so equitably. Um, I have a question uh, in the in the chat, and then I will go over. I'll do a couple ch chat questions, and then I'll go over to the last name um, Ruiz, which has a raised hand. But let me take a couple questions in the chat here. Um, so, uh, the, the Title VI equity analysis includes an absolute change ratio that does not uh, that does not pass the test. It is mentioned that this ratio is the least informative. Why is such a ratio included and allowed to fail? Um, this gets back to the point that was raised about our policy that is written um, that we wrote before ever considering anything quite as monumental as uh, bus network redesign. And as we've tried to lead with equity, um, the example we tried to use to, 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 to show how that can be hard, um, we'll get tied in knots on the absolute change metric if we're not providing sort of one for one service. Uh, so that is not always equitable when service services today um, don't align, don't necessarily align equitably. Trying to bring more equity to the system can be hard. Our intention uh, is to revise that policy and to come up with some better metrics or um, either additional or fewer or ones that we think are actually aligned with determining what is equitable for low income writers and for writers of colors, so uh, of color. So please stay tuned on that one. Uh, there is a um, uh, was a question of are the reports published? And I'd like to ask um, those in the uh, man managing the chat if you could please uh, post a link to the website where you can find these materials. They are absolutely public, and we welcome your reviewing them. I'm going to um, ask to unmute the last name, last name Ruiz, and see if we can get another question. Hi, thank you so much for um, for hearing uh, my question. Um, I, I was curious uh, to understand to what extent you considered um, the transportation choices people have available to them when prioritizing access to bus um, mobility through buses. So, for example, did you consider access to blue bikes? as an opportunity for complementing trips or the, helping that last mile or getting people to the faster, more efficient train? Um, did you consider uh, other elements such as availability of ride share, um, a, a access to walking and sidewalks, like some areas do have sidewalks, some don't have sidewalks. So not looking just at income and whether you take the bus or not, but like how the mo how accessible your mobility is based on the different choices you have available. Maybe one person can take a bus and an Uber and a bike and walk. That person has way more access than someone who's at the top of a hill with no city bikes and no or like no blue bikes and um, doesn't have access to 
other areas. So that's just a question, like, how do you think about the big picture of like helping people get from point A to point B? Sure. And how your work um, might complement, be supported, or be excluding the components of a trip beyond the bus. Thank you. Sure. Th thank you for the question. Uh, there's a there's a lot to un unpack there. I would say, uh, particularly on the issue of micro mobility, so things like um, blue bikes or other um, ride hailing, uh, the MBTA uh, thinks an awful lot about what is uh, what what should our relationship be with those mobility um, services. And sometimes they're partners of ours. Uh, issues around accessibility certainly jump to the forefront. Not everybody can ride a bike. <laughs> Not everybody can afford an, an Uber. To your to your point, part of the work of bus network redesign was to make bus competitive, uh, and competitiveness is a factor that we're looking at to say what would make anybody want to ride a bus, uh, and so frequency and reliability and service coverage and many of the things that people have mentioned, while keeping bus affordable uh, for everybody, are some of the things that we are are looking at, and so. Um, but I think there's a bigger question, really outside of how we think about equity, about the role of the MBTA. Uh, as potentially a partner or to design with um, other mobility partners. I, I we'll just say one last point on this one. Um, uh, players who are maybe a little newer to the market, um, uh, sometimes for the MBTA, it's hard for us to figure out how to plan with those individuals. We've been in service for a long time and are going to be here for a long time. If we designed our bus network thinking about uh, where current docking stations were or where a um, circulator trip made happen that's run by a business community and they change their plans. Now our service network has been based upon those. So it raises a lot, you raises a lot of questions, uh, not quite so tied up to how we conduct equity analyses, but I appreciate them. Uh, and clearly I like to think about these things. So I'll move on to the next <laughs> question. Um, it looks like we have, um, uh, let's see, a question about cell phone data. Um, how do you know the demographics, income, race, age, et cetera, of each cell phone user, or are you relying on the average demographics of the area? And I'm going to invite one of my colleagues, I'm not sure who, to unmute and share an answer here. It's probably, I see Jenna Lise turned on her camera. Thank you. I'll volunteer. <laughs> um, so the, the location-based services data is um, guessing at where a cell phone lives or the, the home base of that cell phone and then estimates the demographics based on a, an area of the neighborhood. Um, it is not to the tied to the individual phone, um, and that was to address some of the privacy concerns, so. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a comment in the in the chat. We currently have the 350 running from Alwife to Burlington Mall uh, and all of the retail en route. How will those who work at the mall travel when they get off of work at 10 p.m.? The people who work, shop, and commute between the Red Line and Arlington, Winchester, Woburn, and Burlington are part of the population that are lower income and BIPOC. In the new plan, there is no service at night. Um, and I would note that while we understand that individuals in this new map that we have planned, uh, and we believe that we've put equity at the forefront in our design, um, we know that some some have more coverage, some have more service, some have less service, um, or some have service that is different than today. So we'll continue to look at these matters and I will share the concern about the 350 with our service planning team. So Lindsay, I know I'm yeah. not supposed to talk about these things, but the proposed new 80 route is slated to go until after midnight, like the 350 does today. So look at the proposed 80 route in the plan because it doesn't end at 10 o'clock. So I just wanted to no, perfect. We have an answer, then we can help. Let's get it out there. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> um, um, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, there is another one in a somewhat similar vein. Thank you for passing along concerns about eliminating routes. You are canceling the 94 bus and the alternative would be uh, one and a half or one mile from my home. There are many people who use this bus for work and for doctor's appointments. So we will pers certainly pass along the concerns about the 94. Uh, will the recording of tonight's P presentation be available in less than 13 days. For some reason, I could not see the slides in my browser and heard almost nothing while attempting to connect several times. Uh, this meeting is definitely being recorded. I believe I heard earlier today that it should be up on the website by tomorrow. Let me confirm that. Um, someone's gonna tell me if I have that right. It will absolutely be up on the website. I see another comment was asking if um, this meeting is um, going to be available and it certainly will be up on our website. 
I'm pausing because I think someone's going to tell me when it will be available. I'm. It might not. Oh, tomorrow. Tomorrow's a Friday. We might not have it up tomorrow. You should have it up by early next week. Uh, sorry for that. Um, Justin, do you have something more to add to that? We will start processing the video and try to get it online as soon as we can. We'll start that process first thing tomorrow morning. And I, I'm, I'm assuming, Justin, we probably can get the slides up sooner and the video will take just a little bit longer. So uh, yes. we'll, we will, we're, we're on it. <laughs> and I'm sorry that you couldn't hear or see things. Um, that seems frustrating. Um, what about, uh, next comment, what about people with disabilities who have to travel more and cannot get to the uh, bus stop 55 in the Fenway? Uh, I want to thank you for your comment. We'll pass that along uh, for individuals um, along the 55 route. Um, are you considering the suburban communities equitably along with minorities, poor people, and the elderly? And if so, how? Uh, so uh, equity analysis are done by riders, not by community. So we look at where our low-income riders are and where our riders of color live in any system, in any neighborhood, in the in the suburbs, in the in the city, and then they are all considered par in in part of that analysis. So absolutely, um, low-income uh, people and people of color are considered throughout the throughout the network. Um, uh, why was the second iteration of the map not given a three month public comment period as was done with the first map? This is a new plan. There was no time for comments to be properly collected. 13 days of review is inconsiderate to the writing public for this to be reviewed and discussed and will be the, the board, be, board be voting on this next week. Um, uh, thank you for your comment. As we told the board, we would be finalizing the equity analysis. La last, we told them last month we'd be finalizing the equity analysis and be coming back to them. We needed that. Um, that's sort of the second map, uh, the revised map to be uh, completed in order to complete the equity analysis and understand the implications. And we will hold true to our plan to bring this to the board uh, next week. I believe on the 15th, I'm not sure now, uh, next Thursday. Is the MBTA collaborating with local advocacy groups to better understand underrepresented community needs? If yes, what are the sum of the groups that the MBTA has worked with I feel like we have talked to many, many, many groups. Maybe I will ask either Justin or Melissa if they want to share some of the many groups from um, uh, social justice, advocacy groups, transit groups, municipal groups, uh, and want to uh, share uh, those those individuals uh, or those those names. Does anyone have something at handy? I can mention some of the folks we've worked with, but I do want to say that doesn't necessarily imply any endorsement um, because with many thank you things, uh, but uh, certainly uh, we have, you know, Mela here and we've had many conversations with uh, Mela and the ACE folks. We uh, were working with, uh, oh, uh, Chelsea and the Green Roots uh, team. We were, had several meetings with the Mass Senior Action Council. We were working with different municipalities that might have uh, different um, kind of uh, community uh, transit advocacy groups or cycling advocacy or uh, kind of uh, kind of all the bikes and peds and transit advisory committees uh, that we have in several of our municipalities that uh, we're thinking about these issues. So there's lots of uh, different organizations that we've been uh, meeting with and also just trying to go out to bus stops and having conversations uh, with riders, uh, meeting them where they were was a very important part of the uh, outreach process for us. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, our next comment, um, how will people with mobility issues and or disabilities get to the next bus stop when their bus stop is being discontinued? This relates to the 55 bus in the, uh, on the Fenway. Um, and I certainly am happy to pass that comment along about the 55. Um, we obviously think an awful lot about our riders um, with disabilities and wanna make sure we still are providing them uh, meaningful access to to transit and to our services. I will note that the questions have now been answered in the chat and I don't see any raised hands. Um, I also note it's 731, so maybe you all wanted to be done with this meeting in an hour and a half, uh, but I will hang tight for another minute to see if anyone raises their hand. And I see one more last name. Is it Nagum? Am I saying that correctly? 
Yes, Nagam. My name is Anita Nagam. I live in Medford, and I am calling specifically about the 94 and the 96, but it is an issue that I don't think you've considered across the system. You first are eliminating the 94, which leaves a large section of West Medford with no bus option. It was suggested at the last meeting that people who can't walk to the new routes, which will access the red line, take the 95 bus and go to Winthrop Circle and then take that bus to the red line. I don't think that you have considered that people who get on one bus and have to transfer to another bus will use up their transfer on that second bus. They will then have to pay another full fare when they get on the subway. This will effectively double the cost of every ride for all of these riders. It is the same thing with the 96 bus, which will no longer go to Harvard Square, which is a main bus hub. Anyone who needs to get there now from Medford would have to either take the red line at Davis, take one of the buses, get through the red line at Davis, then transfer, um, well, you could, you could go there, but if you needed to transfer to another bus at Harvard, it, it again would be, three modes of transportation, meaning two fares. Yeah. I personally transfer to buses at Harvard Square. I know a lot of other people do because it is a main bus hub. It would take me a bus, a subway, and then an additional fare for that third segment of the trip. I'm sure this applies to other sections, to other areas in the entire bus map. You have not really fully considered the effect of eliminating service for people. And I think this plan needs to be reevaluated. And you certainly need to consider the fair consequences of eliminating routes and making people take three modes of transit to complete one trip. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, a couple of um, important things, and I'll invite my colleague, Stephen Povich, to respond. Uh, in the last year, the MBTA did change our fare policy regarding transfers, largely to think about bus network redesign and some things that were coming along along the line. So I think we have some updated information that will uh, uh, potentially resolve some of the concerns that you have raised. Please go ahead, Stephen. Yes, thank you, and, and thank you for the comment. As of July 1st, 2022, we've changed our transfer policy so that a journey can consist of two buses and one subway or three buses. So bus to bus to subway, bus to subway to bus, subway to bus to bus, or bus to bus to bus for the fare of the most expensive service. So either bus or subway. So I know you described a number of trips that included two bus legs and one subway leg. Those would cost 240 full fare for the entire journey. I appreciate that in the past that wasn't the case, but again, as of July 1st, 2022, we've broadened our transfer policy to make uh, more legs of your journey included uh, as one trip. Thank you very much, Stephen. I hope I hope that is helpful um, and uh, was certainly a, con a concern uh, advocated by those uh, involved in bus network redesign to make sure we didn't have that particular problem. Uh, I would like to thank uh, somebody on the, who responded with a comment, just saying thank you for your service to the community. We appreciate you. <laughs> um, I want to um, uh, uh, I, uh, we have a comment that eliminating service is a hardship for those of for those who use services. This is a hardship for me. Making people walk much longer distances in bad snow, ice, or extremely hot weather is cruel and a hardship. And I want to thank you very much for. Uh, your comment. Uh, at this point in time, I want to appreciate our many interpreters uh, who have been with us tonight. We have a closed captioning interpreter. We've had uh, two American Sign Language interpreters with us. Um, we have uh, both our Spanish interpreter and our Mandarin interpreter. I should pause and just make sure, were there any questions that the interpreters received um, in the, in the um, either the, the Spanish language room or the Mandarin room? Thank you. And in the Spanish room? 
Tracy, do you have anything there? No questions. Okay. All right. Well, I really want to thank you all for spending your e your Thursday evening with us. Uh, the MBTA very much appreciates your uh, feedback and your comments. Uh, our website is here in front of you, mbta.com backslash bus network redesign, BNRD. Uh, you can also contact us at the website, Better Bus Project at mbta.com. We are again so, so very appreciative for you spending the time with us tonight. Uh, and we look forward to the next time we have the chance uh, to have you to have you here. Thank you for being riders of the MBTA. Have a lovely evening and good night.